welcome everyone to today's uh, virtual presentation. Today we have a guest that was on here earlier. Um, I'm going to say a couple, a few months back, and his presentation then was a dozen ways to die in the desert, which was quite interesting, funny, and uh, everything in between. And uh, today we chose another topic called Fort McDowell's Colorful Characters. And these are the subtitle is stuff you don't see at the movies. So Leonard, I think if I'm allowed, can I, I think a good way to describe, I, I think is that you're a historian, if I can use that word. I don't know if you go by that title, but I think it's true. And um, the, these, like I was mentioning, he's, he's been on many boards, including uh, boards, local boards. I think the, uh, the um, I had this open on the Arizona Historical Society a board member in the past uh, state, which is a state of Arizona trustee agency. And he's been very involved in the city of Scottsdale's Historic Preservation Commission, uh, serving on the board of directors of the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy from 2005 through 2011. And been very involved, I think, in the history of Arizona, if I can use that. And, and therefore, I'm excited always because you know that there's a lot of thought and research that are done in these presentations. So I'm going to pass the mic and the screen to Leonard. And thank you very much for your time and your presentation today. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, I'll click the uh, shared screen. Perfect. Uh, Man. Can, you, uh, can you see this? Hold on. Yes, we do. Okay, good. We'll uh, we'll begin the slideshow. All right. Um, this is Fort McDowell. Uh, this is a picture uh, from uh, the late 1880s uh, of the fort. Uh, where was the fort? Uh, the fort was located pretty much where the Fort McDowell Casino is today. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of where it is, uh, it is along Highway 87 as you head north to Payson. Uh, and it is uh, typically off to the left of the highway just before you get to the bridge that crosses the Verde River. Uh, if you are into serious gaming, I don't need to tell you where it is. You know where it is. This picture was taken, as I said, in 1880. Um, and uh, while I don't have a pointer, I'll talk you through what you are looking at. Uh, right in the middle of your screen, you'll see a, a, a series of four buildings. And starting from the right, uh, the first building is the post commander's quarters. The second building is the medical corps headquarters. The third building is the hospital. And the small brick structure is the morgue. That may give you an idea of what life was like at a frontier fort. If you look beyond, you'll see a parade ground. And in the distance, you'll see some low brown dwellings. Uh, those are actually stables for uh, horses to be used by the cavalry. And if you move to the right, you'll see some other low brown dwellings, which are quarters for enlisted men. And then you'll see some small, some tiny white houses, which are officers' quarters. We get some interesting questions about this particular picture. Uh, one of the observations we get is, gee, I didn't realize they had colored film back in the 1880s. Well, they didn't. Uh, this is something called hand tinting. Uh, this photograph was taken to be made into postcards sold commercially. So this was hand tinted after the fact. Uh, the second question we usually get is, gee, this looks like it was taken from a certain height. Uh, what did they do? Did they use a balloon or how, how did they take this picture? Well, by the late 1880s, the post had a water tower and was able to pump water from the Verde River. So if you can imagine a photographer in the 1880s with one of those huge cameras that used glass plates, climbing up a water tower and setting up his camera and taking his photo. Uh, that's probably the way this image was taken. 
Um, a number of organizations support the research that I do, and without giving you a full 60 second commercial, just take a minute uh, or a few seconds to look at this. Uh, these are the organizations that uh, basically uh, I owe uh, whatever my accomplishments are as a researcher to for their support. Um, in order to discuss the fort, we need to know a little bit about why the fort is where it is or was where it was. And so that involves us in a discussion of the Yavapai and the Apache. I'm going to need your help here. There was a comedian popular on TV emerged from the Borst Belt many years ago who used to tug on his tie and he would say, I don't get no respect. Who, who was that? Anybody know? Rodney, Dang Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield. Rodney Dangerfield. There we go. That's the name I was thinking of. Well, the Yavapai, as Native Americans, are the Rodney Dangerfields of American history. Uh, they get no respect. And that's because they used to intermarry with the Apaches, and everyone feared the Apaches. And so when they met a Yavapai who was intermarried with an Apache, they assumed that the Yavapai were Apaches when they were actually a distinct tribe, a distinct Native American nation. So you'll find very little in the early history of Arizona about the Yavapai. You'll hear about Mojave Apaches, and that's basically an interpretive term for Yavapai. Uh, but the two, the two uh, particular Native American groups were rather close uh, and intermarried. For those of you who are linguists, uh, the Avapai show up in central Arizona around 1450. They're, they're, they weren't native to the central part of the state. They were in their own way uh, invaders and pushed out the Pima and the Papago Indians. In their language, Pai means people and Yava means sun. So to be Yavapai would mean you are one of the tribe that are the people of the sun. And the specific subgroup uh, that was here in central Arizona was the Quevcapaya. And they ranged from what is today the town of Camp Verde, all the way through the Superstition Mountains and the Pinals, which are further south, and through the Scottsdale area and into the McDowell Mountains. And as we said before, they were allied with uh, the Apache, particularly the Tonto Apache band that lived in Four Peaks. They were hunters and gatherers. Uh, and as we said, their historical impact is often underestimated. Um, in 1863, gold and silver was discovered in three different locations, not too far away from where we all are today. Uh, in Wickenburg, uh, at a place called Rich Hill in the Bradshaw Mountains, uh, and uh, one other place uh, in, uh, in the Bradshaws. And what was going on in 1863 in the United States? Civil War. Um, and governments have to pay for wars sooner or later. So the United States government was very interested in these gold and silver discoveries. So of course, miners arrive after the prospectors find the, the precious metal, miners arrive to mine, but miners have to eat. And so farmers and ranchers come in, but they need land. So whose land are they taking? They're taking the lands of the Yavapai and the Tonto Apache to run their cattle and raise food for the miners. Now, starting day one, there aren't any grocery stores here, okay? The gold waters haven't moved in yet. Okay, so there, there's no way to get stuff like refined sugar, flour, coffee, kitchen utensils, all the stuff that you and I take for granted, it's not here. So where does it come from? Well, it comes from California or from Colorado River settlements by boat in large 20 mule train wagons, wagons that can carry 20 tons or more of merchandise uh, pulled by 40 mules and on which the wheels are taller than I am and I'm just a shade under six feet tall. Now, if you're a hunter gatherer culture, 
and you're used to hunting and gathering and raiding, okay, other tribes, all of a sudden you see these rad, uh, wagons coming in with flour, sugar, salt, metal utensils, all the things that a Yavapai wife would want. And so any self-respecting Yavapai wife would look at her husband or she, or if she was a young lady, look at her boyfriend and say, okay, you're supposed to be a big hunter and gatherer. Well, look at this. We've got Walmart on wheels coming into our territory. I want you to hunt and gather. I want those metal utensils. I want that coffee. I want that refined sugar. And so the Avapai allied with the Tonto Apache began raiding supply, uh, supply trains and raiding ranches for beef, et cetera. Well, that draws the attention of the United States government and the United States government decides to send in its number one tool of diplomacy, which is the United States Army. And so Fort McDowell is built and it's built on the Verde River. Uh, this is an old map, we won't belabor it, but if you look down toward the lower left center of the map, you'll see Camp McDowell on the Verde River. And you'll see another camp called Camp Reno headed to the north, in other words, to the right and up a little bit. And you'll see a black line and you'll see the Mazatzal Mountains or Matazals as, as Arizonans call them. That black line is a raiding trail. That's a trail that the Yavapai and the Apache would follow from the Mazatzal Mountains across the Verde River into the Bradshaw Mountains to raid mines and ranches and farms and uh, basically uh, trading vehicles, whatever they ran, ran across. They would come back along that trail and hide out in the uh, Madison Mountains until the heat was off, until they weren't being pursued. That's why the fort is where it is. Uh, it was established in 1865, and you may hear me use Camp McDowell and Fort McDowell interchangeably because the name was changed in 1879. Uh, it was needed to protect miners, and it was located on the Verde River, uh, not too far from the confluence with the Salt River. The post complement ranged from about 200 to 500 cavalry, Soldiers maintained gardens of their own using reconstituted Hohokam canals for irrigation. If you look at the picture down the lower picture, those aren't dead horses. Um, what's happening is that's a training exercise uh, involving the 6th Cavalry, uh, which was stationed for a while at Fort McDowell. And what's happening is these soldiers are being trained to put their horses on the ground, and the horses are being trained not to go absolutely nuts when a rifle is fired inches away from their ears. Uh, and this would, be, would have been a typical defensive exercise for troops in the field. Put your horse down, get behind your horse, put your rifle to your shoulder, uh, and hope like heck that your horse doesn't panic. Uh, McDowell was involved, the fort was involved in uh, the Indian Wars, particularly a nasty campaign during 1872 and 1873, uh, during the winter, which was very hard on Native American women and children, uh, and therefore forced the Avapai onto reservations. Um, these are some of the units that were at the fort. You can see a cavalryman uh, and a Frederick Remington rendition of an infantryman. Uh, one of the units, you'll see the 10th Cavalry there, is highlighted in gold. Uh, that was a colored unit, as they would say at the time. Uh, the Buffalo Soldiers, if you're a West Western historian, because their hair was kinky, and the Native Americans thought that uh, their hair reminded them of, of Buffalo. Uh, if you were a soldier at Fort McDowell, you were paid $16 a month. Uh, bear in mind, this is at a time when a typical cowboy who was looked down on by everyone was paid a dollar a day plus room and board. So you can get an idea of the kinds of people that ended up in the army. They were either immigrants uh, or they were uh, born Americans who for one reason or another couldn't make it in civilian life. The boots that they wore were manufactured by convict labor uh, and there were no right and left foot boots back then. Boots were uh, made 
with what was called a straight soul. So uh, the army philosophy was cure your boots, either your feet are gonna fit the boots or your boots are gonna fit the feet, we don't care. Um, the uniform was just wonderful for Arizona in the summer, woolen coat, woolen trousers, woolen socks, woolen or flannel long underwear, and a government issued hat, cap, or personal cover. Uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't wear wool in the middle of the summer like this. Uh, these folks had very little choice. Uh, they had a haversack that contained eating utensils, and you can see it on the side of this infantryman. It's on his uh, left hip. Uh, it's on the right of your screen, of course. It had coffee beans, a tobacco twist, a tin cup, soap, and a razor. Now, why soap? Well, personal hygiene is typically what we hear people say when we ask that question, and that's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is, you remember those boots? What they would do with the soap is they would soap the inside and the outside of their socks, put them on their feet, and then slide their feet into the boots so that they could cut down on the number of blisters uh, from hiking over desert terrain with boots that were ill-fitting. And they had a housewife. Hey, how could this be bad? They were in the field marching with a housewife? You've never heard this term before. Uh, in the old army, a housewife was another name for a sewing kit. Buttons, needles, uh, scissors. Uh, and you're probably thinking, yeah, you know, that's pretty cool because if the, the buttons on your coat uh, come off, that's fine. There's a more important reason. Remember, this is before the invention of the zipper. And so there are some buttons that are created more equal than others and more important than others. And that's why you need a sewing kit. Um, pay was often delayed up to six months on the frontier. Uh, when they were in the field, they got one blanket, one poncho, and one waterproof shelter half. If you wanted to make a complete tent, you had to buddy up with somebody and sleep together. The food was government beef provided by the lowest bidder. Uh, hardtack and salt pork on the trail. Coffee. If you wanted fruits and vegetables, if the post farm had them and, and had grown them, you got them. Otherwise, you'd have to pay two or three dollars for a can of fruit. Tough to do on $16 a month. Uh, these folks would spend weeks on patrol in the desert and the mountains, often in cold camps with no fire. And they would sleep in, in the washes because the ground was softer. We're going to give you a different perspective from the soldier's perspective today. When we talk about colorful characters, usually we think of, you know, these guys who are on the frontier and, you know, they're rugged. We're going to talk a little bit about a side of frontier life that you usually don't see, uh, even in the movies. Our first person is Julia Kirkham Davis. She was at Camp McDowell in September 1869 through February of 1870. Now, before getting here, she married Captain Murray Davis of the United States Army in May of 1868 in Oakland, California, when she was 17 years old. Think about when you were 17, okay? She marries this Army officer. And this is the old Army, not the new Army. He's a highly competent and highly regarded officer, so the Army says, eh, Take a year, go to Europe, have fun, build your relationship. And apparently they were successful at building their relationship because they had a son born before they came back. They return to Oakland and they discover that Murray has gotten orders to the hellhole of the Southwest, Camp McDowell, in the middle of the forbidding desert. Well, Murray packs up his gear, gets on a ship, sails to San Diego, and he assumes, like all Victorian gentlemen, that his young 17-year-old wife is going to stay back in Oakland and pine, pine, I tell you, for her return. Well, as soon as he's out the door, she packs up all the furniture, gets on the next ship, 
sails down to San Diego. Doesn't want to tell him she's there. I mean, they're newlyweds, right? And they're they're in love. So she wants to surprise him. And so she asks the captain if when the captain went ashore, he could contact Murray Davis and tell him that there were letters on the ship, the captain's ship. Captain does this. He's, you know, he's in on it. He, he thinks this is cool. So Murray Davis goes to the ship. Oh, by the way, you see this photograph here on the right-hand side? I don't know how many of you have been to San Diego, but that's San Diego the same year that Julia Kirkham Davis was there. So it gives you an idea of what it looked like. So Murray goes to the ship, and he's expecting letters, and voila, here's the surprise. His beloved is there. So he does the only thing that a real man can do. He points back north and says, you're going back to Oakland. And she says, sweetie, I spent all of our money to move our furniture down here by ship. So I can't pay to go back. And by the way, I'm not staying in San Diego. So at the age of 18, and we know how much she weighed from medical records, at the age of 18, weighing all of 90 pounds, carrying for an infant son, remember, who was born on their honeymoon in Europe, she crosses the Mojave and Sonoran deserts from San Diego to Camp McDowell on horseback, riding side saddle. How many of you have taken the, the automobile trip between Phoenix and San Diego? That's a long trip. Imagine doing this on horseback. Did I mention it, take, it took 30 days? Oh, did I mention it was August? So what are her observations? Thirst, no one, one does not know what thirst means until one has toiled under such a sun. She gets to Camp McDowell and there's an image of Camp McDowell as it looked about the time that she got here. I looked in vain, those low mounds which looked only like hillocks where I discovered the dwellings. I was finally conducted to my residence, a two-roomed adobe hut with walls and a floor without an article of furniture. For this, I had left civilization, comfort, and security. Packing crates made everything, toilet tables, seats, bookcases, sofas, wardrobes. They didn't have any furniture. You remember we talked about those 20 mule teams that would bring in supplies. The supplies had packing cases. Everybody would go after the packing cases to use them to make furniture. This is a, an interesting observation from her. Uh, and it's one that we as Americans uh, typically cannot relate to. Now, I would assume, and particularly in the early years of the state of Israel, that there are many Israelis who would commiserate with this particular state. And that is, what happens in an environment where a spouse lives in a combat zone with the other spouse who's in the military? What is that like? Well, the worst was when my husband had to go scouting. Sometimes they would bring back wounded men, sad to see the poor fellows coming back to die slowly and painfully so far from home. The poisoned arrows were almost always fatal and caused great suffering. They knew I would do what I could. I could only make them shabby little crosses. The living felt the dead were cared for and the dying knew it would be so. Uh, what officers' wives often did on the frontier uh, was provide comfort to troops who came back uh, severely injured or uh, dying. Uh, and this was obviously something that, that she did at, at McDowell. In 1875, Julia contracts a fatal illness, still very young. The reason we know so much about Julia and about the fort is that she spent the last three days uh, of her life reminiscing on her deathbed. And there was a friend of hers, another woman, who took down everything that she said. 
rule. Uh, and so we, we have many of these recollections from Murray Davis, after his wife's death, left the Army and being highly regarded, uh, he became a director of the United States Mint in San Francisco and eventually uh, was appointed minister. We didn't have ambassadors back then, we had ministers. He was in effect appointed the ambassador to China by President Grant and confirmed by the Senate in 1877. But he died later that year never got to leave the United States. That young boy who rode uh, in the saddle with his mother as an infant uh, was adopted by Julia's father, a retired general in Oakland, and changed his name to Stanton Davis Kirkham and became one of the most popular philosophers and travel writers in the United States uh, at the turn of the century, the late 1800s, early 1900s. Another woman who's very interesting, and uh, if you are interested in women's histories of the West, this is one of the best, is Martha Summerhays. You can get her book at any bookstore. You can get it uh, uh, on the internet from Amazon and other, other places. She was born in Nantucket, educated in Europe, in fact, in Prussia, where she lived with a military family. Uh, she married, uh, she, she decided when she came back to the States, she wanted to be the wife of a, a soldier. So she married John Summerhays, a lieutenant in the Army Quartermaster Corps, and eventually ended up being stationed at Fort McDowell from 1876 to 1878. She's here for quite a while by Army uh, standards. She would often reminisce uh, in old age, and her children finally at one point said, Mom, write a book already. So she did. It's called Vanished Arizona. She wrote it in 1908 at the insistence of her children. Now, what were her observations? This is a picture of her on the left. She's the lady in the, the big white dress. Now this is the Victorian era. You look closely, she's not wearing a corset. That's a baggy dress by Victorian standards. And the reason for that is when army wives got out here, particularly in the summer, that whalebone corset that was laced up your back every morning, that went into a locker somewhere and you just wore loose dresses to be comfortable. Uh, here are some of her observations. It was by no means an idle post. The life at Camp McDowell meant hard work, exposure and fatigue. I had a glass jar of butter sent over from the commissary. It had melted and separated into layers of dead white, deep orange, and pinkish purple. There's a story behind this. One of the commissary officers who was a friend of her husband's was visiting the fort and they had him over for dinner and he was bragging about what a great job uh, the commissary uh, service was doing for the military. So she had their butler uh, go over to the commissary and get this jar of butter and she basically put it on the table and said, oh, you're doing such a great job? Look at this, explain this rainbow of colors. Mr. Thomas was actually a lieutenant. Mr. was, uh, a term that was used in the old army for uh, second lieutenants and first lieutenants, said he could not understand why we wore such bags of dresses. This is something every woman wants to hear about her wardrobe, right? Why are you wearing such a baggy dress? Well, we said that, I told him specifically that if the women up at Fort Whipple, which is up in Prescott in the cool country, uh, would come down to McDowell and spend the summer, they would soon be able to explain it to him. After a few days spent with us, however, the mercury ranging from 104 to 120 degrees in the shade, he ceased to comment on our dresses or customs. Now, this is a rhetorical question, but it's for those of you who actually spend a full summer in Arizona, and particularly those of you who have spent several full summers in Arizona. The scene is Martha and her husband are on the back porch of 
uh, Corliss, who's the commander of the post, they're on his back porch and they're looking at four peaks off in the distance. It's the summer. And Corliss says, four years I have sat here and looked at the four peaks and I'm getting almighty tired of it. Martha and Jack had several children. Like most military families, they were transferred frequently. They retired from the Army in 1900, lived in several cities, principally Nantucket and Washington, D.C. Martha publishes Vanished Arizona in 1908, and it is a major hit in the United States. She is one of our popular authors. You know who her number one fans were? You may be thinking, boy, I bet you women were really interested in this. Her number one fans were retired military. Guys who had served in the West read her book and said, oh man, did she capture what it was like? Um, Jack passed away in 1911. Martha passed away in 1926. They are buried next to each other at Arlington National Cemetery. Women on the post. Officers had ladies. Enlisted men did not have ladies. Enlisted men had their wives. It was officers and the ladies, enlisted men and their wives. All the women on the post were officially designated camp followers. Now I know what you're thinking, gee, I, you know, when I read stuff about the West, camp followers means that these are, are women of ill repute. Not in the eyes of the army. Anybody who was on a post and was not officially attached to the army payroll was considered a camp follower. That included wives, it included hospital matrons, it included domestics, maids, cooks, governesses. There was one exception. Look at that woman there with that hand on her hip. This is a woman I would not want to cross. She looks like she owns whatever she looks at. She's a laundress. There were four laundresses authorized for every company of infantry or cavalry. They were entitled to army housing and therefore were not camp followers. They were usually supplied tents and they had army rations. Their pay was a dollar a month per enlisted man whose laundry they did and $5 a month for every officer whose laundry they did. So some of them were paid better than the soldiers. Some earned extra money by providing, shall we say, euphemistically amorous services. I don't think we need to go much farther with that. They were often the objects of matrimonial overtures from enlisted men. And occasionally the cause of physical confrontations between soldiers. And occasionally the objects of health exams by post surgeons because of some of their amorous activities. Um, venereal disease was a major incapacitator of troops in the American West after the Civil War. We're gonna talk a little bit about Marie. On September 20th of 1874 at Fort McDowell at 11 p.m. in the evening, Private Thomas Ward of Company E of the 5th Cavalry has been drinking heavily and hanging around the laundress quarters of Marie. He wants to, as a later newspaper account put it, force his intentions on her. He is rebuffed. Ward threatens her life. He leaves and returns later with a carbine and shatters the window to uh, the building that she's in, the cabin that she's in with its front. She's terrified, for good reason, and flees to the quarters next door of Mr. Warden, who's a civilian, and his wife. Warden's wife realizes there's a soldier outside. <clears throat> He's liquored up. He has a firearm. She finds her husband's firearm, hands it to him. Ward, the inebriated soldier, enters the warden quarters and yells, now I've got you. Warden, the civilian, says, don't shoot. Please, don't shoot. 
But Ward fires. Fortunately, because he's under the influence, he doesn't hit anyone. Warden returns fire, and unfortunately, uh, Ward is fatally hit, staggers out of the quarters, and falls to the ground dead. A local judge is called in because this is a civilian matter, not a military matter, because the killer uh, was a civilian. The judge, after just a few minutes of speaking with people at the fort, simply waves it off as justifiable homicide. Things you don't see in the movies. We're going to cover two more things. How are we doing for uh, for time, Rabbi? You're doing great. Thank you. Okay. This is something uh, called a post return. Once a month, the commander of every post was required to file a post return. And these were rather extensive documents. He had to account for all the material, all the horses, all the murals, report on the condition of the building, report on any patrols that went out, uh, report on troops who were sick, lame, or lazy, uh, people who were being court-martialed, births and deaths uh, on the post, uh, you name it, uh, arrivals and departures of people not associated with the post. This particular page lists civilian employees. And if you look at the middle column, you can see that um, there's, a, uh, there's a blacksmith who gets $100 a month, which was great pay compared to what soldiers were getting back then. You have a guide who gets $45 a month. Um, and up at the top, you have a pack master who gets $100 a month. Now, this is November 5th of 1870. And if you look at the name of the pack master, take a close look. Does that look like Haji Ali? Haji Ali? How does a guy with a name like Haji Ali end up at an army post in the middle of the Arizona Territory? Well, we're going to introduce you to Haji Ali. Haji Ali is called locally Haji Ali because Americans have a problem with Haji Ali. So he's Haji Ali to everybody. He's really Philip Tedro or Philip Tedru. He's a Syrian, sort of. He's also a Greek, sort of, and an Ottoman citizen an Orthodox Catholic who converted to Islam. You want color? This is color. And he's a camel driver. He is retained by Lieutenant Edward Beale of the United States Navy to serve as a camel handler and packer for an experiment that the United States Army wants to do out here in Arizona and California. And that is, they want to see if they can form a Camel Corps um, to work in the desert. And this is in 1856, before the Civil War. There it is, a Camel Corps, an Army idea. Now, only the United States Army could hire a Greek, Syrian, Ottoman, Catholic, Muslim for a project that is an army project headed by a, a lieutenant from the United States Navy. You want color? This is color. Well, 33 camels are purchased in the Middle East and shipped to the United States. They're well adapted to the Sonoran Desert. Really not a bad idea, except for the fact that horses and mules are scared of them. And so wherever you have a, a camel in close proximity to a horse, uh, or a mule, they're going to panic. So the camels get a bad rap. Uh, here's a picture uh, of a camel and a horse. They're not together, you notice they're spread apart. They're both hitched uh, at a military post. And you can see the curious soldiers here who are looking at this camel. Well, the camel experiment was canceled uh, in 1864 because the army had better things to do. They were fighting the Civil War. So the animals were auctioned off. 
Bo remained as a packer for the Army until 1870 and kept some of the camels. He served with the Quartermaster Department at Camp, excuse me, at Camp McDowell as a civilian, eventually married a local, and ran his own freighting business along the Colorado River. The business failed, so Tedrow releases his camels in the desert near Gila Bend, and for about the next 20 to 30 years, people are seeing camels traveling through the desert, lonely, uh, isolated beasts. In 1885, Tedro works as a packer for General George Crook in northern Mexico, where Crook's people are pursuing Geronimo, the uh, Indian chief, native chief. He spends his final years near Quartzite as a miner, and he takes his final camel ride into the great beyond in 1902. And the grateful citizens of Arizona decided to do something unique. Now, they don't know much about the Middle East, but somebody has the idea, this guy was cool. This, this guy did a lot of interesting things. He was really part of Arizona color. Let's build a pyramid over his grave. And so if you're traveling to California and you're passing through Quartzsite, you pull off the road, you can see Haji Ali, and his grave with the pyramid. And finally, with deep apologies to Rabbi, to Rabbi Levitov, we need to talk about chaplains. I want you to understand that as we tell you this story, this has nothing to do with Rabbi Levitov. Although it is someone who is, in fact, a chaplain. Chaplains were concerned with troops, spiritual, moral, and physical health. And that was a challenge in the post-Civil War Western frontier. Alcoholism was rampant, venereal disease was rampant, and some soldiers carried issues of post-traumatic stress and hostility with them. Although at that time, we were unaware of what these were. They were not identified as, uh, as issues. What happens though when a chaplain goes rogue? Rabbi's never gone rogue, right? Well, meet Charles Blake. Now we've, we've put a little oval over him because this is not Charles Br Blake. We, we don't have a picture uh, of Charles Blake uh, at this point in his life. Uh, so we're going to use the image of this chaplain. He was a captain. He was a Civil War veteran. Uh, shortly after the Civil War, for reasons that are unclear, charges were preferred. He was court-martialed in 1866, but he was found innocent, and he was reinstated as a chaplain, but not with back pay. And so what happened was two congressmen passed what were called private laws back then, where they would go to Congress and say, I have a bill to pay Charles Blake for back pay uh, that uh, he didn't receive because he was court-martialed, et cetera, et cetera. So he received remuneration for these private laws or private bills. And in October of 1866, Blake arrives at Fort Whipple in Prescott, which was the capital of the territory at the time. And he's selected as chaplain to the third territorial state legislature. And he's here at a, a sad time. On May 2nd of 1867, um, he presides over the funeral of Margaret McCormick. And you can see her in the lower picture. Very young woman, 24 years old, died in childbirth along with the child that she was bearing. She was very popular in uh, the territory and around Prescott. And so uh, there were many mourners, many people deeply moved by her passing. He was on a minor reported that Blake delivered a touching discourse full of beautiful illusions for the dead and that the weeping audience uttered a fervent amen to the earnest prayer of the chaplain. He is eventually assigned to Fort McDowell, actually Camp McDowell back then, from 1867, October to February of 1869. In January, 
He writes seven letters in one day to the camp commander, to the post commander, saying he should be allowed to inspect all post records, all post records, personnel records, financial records, medical records, uh, correspondence, seven letters in one day. Now, I want you to understand that the distance between Chaplain Blake's quarters and the commander's quarters was probably not more than 30 yards. Well, this is a guy sending seven letters in one day to the post commander. He complains of discourtesy from the other officers and begins asking multiple times for sick leave up to four months. Finally, not being satisfied, not receiving satisfaction from the post commander, he goes AWOL, absent without leave, just walks away from the post for four months and starts wandering around the territory. He's reported in a number of locations, pops up in Yuma over on uh, the Colorado River. And eventually in September, he reappears at McDowell and starts writing multiple letters again on a daily basis to the post commander. Well, he also, every month like clockwork, requests seven days leave to visit the Pima settlements, the Pima Indian settlements, and hold religious services. The post commander's got a real issue with this because here's a person who's behaving erratically. Do we really want to have this person holding religious services for Native Americans? So clearly the post commander on multiple occasions refuses these requests. Blake doesn't give up. He insists on a team of soldiers to build and teach in a post school. He wants to educate the troops, many of whom are illiterate. They can't read or write. So there's an interesting thing going on here. This is clearly a man who's got something emotional going on, but he also seems to be altruistic. He wants to do things for others, but he's not getting satisfaction. The same day that he asks for the team of soldiers, he asks for 30 days leave to go to Tucson. The territorial capital has been moved now from Prescott to Tucson, so he can see the territorial legislature in session. We've got a problem here. Finally, the post commander places the chaplain under arrest and sends him under guard uh, to San Francisco. While, I'm sorry, let's back up here. While he is in arrest, he requests 30 days leave and also requests, by the way, that his quarters be repaired. Uh, and then complains about his mail being opened by unauthorized persons. Um, which didn't happen. In fact, the post commander wrote a letter to his commander in California and said, you probably got a letter from the chaplain saying that somebody's opening his mail. I can assure you that if you've ever read a letter from this guy, you wouldn't ever open his mail. Uh, so in February, he sent to California under military escort, where based on a review with medical uh, professionals uh, and senior commanders, he's allowed to resign from the army in March because he is adjudged insane. Whereupon he turns around and sues the United States Army and the United States government for reinstatement, even though he resigned. His argument is, I don't remember resigning because I was insane. The case goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And in a famous decision in 1880, Blake versus the United States, the United States Supreme Court says, Blake is right. You cannot hold a person accountable for an action that they may appear to have done voluntarily, but they were not in their right mind when they did so. Blake needs to be reinstated. And so the President of the United States at the time issues 
what you see on your screen. It appears that the chaplain uh, was insane. He needs to be reinstated. Chaplain Blake is restored to the list of post chaplains of the army with his original date of rank and with pay from May 14th, 1878. He becomes a practicing clergyman in San Francisco. He actually leaves the army again and becomes an ardent supporter of Indian citizenship and Indian voting rights, passionate, uh, speaks at all sorts of gatherings to try to convince people to give Native American citizenship and voting rights a man really uh, in many ways ahead of his time. In 1887, he receives additional remuneration from the government via another personal bill introduced in Congress by a congressman, a United States representative, who was a famous former Civil War general by the name of Rosecrans, who apparently thought enough of Blake uh, to do this. Uh, in 1887, he demands that the district attorney uh, in San Francisco investigate lawlessness in the town. And again, in 1887, he pops up in the newspapers demanding that the San Francisco City Council pass an ordinance making snowballing of citizens, carriages, streetcars, a misdemeanor punishable by fine or imprisonment. You don't want to throw a snowball in the presence of this guy. Well, He's eventually elected president of the Presbyterian Ministerial Association. And here again, you end up scratching your head. You know, the guy was respected by some people who knew him, and yet he was erratic. He passed away on June 5th of 1893, and as part of the funeral uh, eulogy, Reverend C.L. Brown uh, delivered an eloquent eulogy on the life of the deceased, showing the purest spirit of benevolence, firmness, and Christianity by which he was guided from the cradle to the grave. So what are we to make of all this? Now let's go back to the beginning and tell you the rest of the story. In 1861, he was a chaplain of United States volunteers during the Civil War. In 1863, he resigned in order to recruit and organize colored troops. He was responsible, along with a very few other people, to raise the first two colored infantry regiments in the United States Army, and uh, two other regiments later, the third and the sixth. And was so highly regarded that he was appointed a colonel, a colonel uh, in the third color regiment. And he was a fighting parson, as they say in those days. He actually led his troops uh, at a siege at Fort Wagner in Charleston, South Carolina. And during that siege, he was wounded in the head. There was a severe concussion from an exploding For years, we did not know what post-traumatic stress was. It's only really in about the last two decades that we've identified it and identified how it affects people. There is no doubt, based on what we now know about Reverend Blake, that this was a man who was deeply affected by post-traumatic stress. And as we close our presentation today, this is a picture, finally, of Reverend Blake, a man who was deeply misunderstood and also deeply respected uh, during his lifetime, and whom we now know uh, was a person who was one of the victims of post trauma uh, He was a colorful character. Unfortunately, that color came from his sacrifices uh, during the Civil War. And with that, we end our colorful characters. So this was great. Um, and does anyone have any questions for Leonard on any of these specific, uh, I'm gonna say characters or about Fort McDowell in general? Don't be shy. But uh, I actually, I like the rogue chaplain one. That was a good one to end with for me. <laughs>
It provokes a lot of thought, doesn't it? I, I actually, uh, the Phoenix Police Department once told me when I went through my background with them, it's like, you know, don't go rogue. It's don't preach while you're wearing our uniform. <laughs> um, Betty or Stan, did you have a question? I saw you unmuted. No, I thought it was really fascinating. You know, I, I mean, the chaplain at the end really kind of pulls this thing together. This was a fascinating guy with a lot of uh, good ideas. And because of the injury that he had during the Civil War, it made him on and off the way he was in later life. Truly. Really? Yeah. I'm wondering what he would have been like without that trauma, you know, how far he could have gone. He was charismatic, you could tell. Yeah. Uh, Paula, you want to add something? So they didn't save any of the history, the, the buildings or anything of the fort. There's nothing. No, and uh, there's a very good reason why. Uh, in either 1903 or 1904, President Theodore Roosevelt deeded the military reservation to the Yavapai Nation. Uh, it was taken over by the Department of the Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, and transformed. Uh, the buildings went away for two reasons. Uh, remember, we talked about how precious wood was on the frontier, particularly lumber, finished wood. Uh, many of the buildings were disassembled by ranchers in the area uh, and used uh, for construction at their ranches. What didn't end up being salvaged by the ranchers has been left to rot or die or crumble by the Yavapai because they view the post as an instrument of repression. Uh, so from their perspective, they're not gonna tear it down uh, because in, in their perspective, it has spirit, uh, it has some meaning but they're going to let it return to the earth uh, as part of their concept of justice. Wow. But I assume the fort looks very similar to the one up at Fort Verde that is restored. I'm sorry, Paula. I said, I assume the fort looked a lot like the one up at Camp Verde, the one up in Verde. Yeah, they were, uh, they were quite similar, yes. They look at, very interesting, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.